Good evening. After we have our pledge, I will have a moment of silence for Richard Ashner, former town of Walk Hill DPW employee, past commissioner, past fire police captain of the County Sound Fire Company. Winfield H. Smiley was a dairy, dairy farmer of the Smiley Farm and longtime resident of Walk Hill. So we could stand up and go. Thank you. Tonight we're going to have two public hearings. The first one will have the third deputy being announced. Please take notice that a public hearing will be held by the town where the town of Walker on March 23rd, 2023, at 7:25 p.m. at Walker Town Hall, 99 County Drive, Building 10, Middle Town, New York. Which time the chat will be able to cover comments and regarding projects to be considered for funding under the 2024 Orange Urban County Consortium Community Development Program. Under this program, a variety of physical improvements as listed below are eligible for funding. Acquisition and disposition of real property, public works, public facilities, or site improvements. Code enforcement, housing and health codes, clearance, demolition, and rehabilitation for public use or economic development, housing rehabilitation loans and grants, special projects for elderly and handicapped, provision of public services, shelters, clinics, senior nutrition, et cetera, payment of non-federal shares of other grant programs, relocation payments and assistance, planning, management, and program administration. The town of will be considering projects to be submitted to the 2024 Orange Urban County Consortium Community Development Program. The deadline for which is March, I'm sorry, June 23rd, 2023. And now, Darlene uh, will read the notice for us in Spanish. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Por favor, tome nota. Una audiencia pública se llevará a cabo este 23 de marzo 2023 a las 7:25 de la noche en el Ayuntamiento de Pueblo de Walk Hill, 99 Tower Drive, Middletown, Nueva York, 10:41. Esta audiencia es ofrecido por medio de las oficinas del Ayuntamiento del Pueblo de Walk Hill. Las oficinas del Ayuntamiento les invita a dar comentarios y sugerencias públicas con referencia a proyectos que podrán ser elegibles para financiamiento por medio del programa 2024 Orange County Consortium Community Development. Bajo este programa, una variedad de arreglos físicos serán elegibles. Adquisición y disposición de bienes y inmuebles, obras públicas, instalaciones públicas y desarrollo económico. Cumplimiento del Código Vivienda y Salud, despeje, domicilio y rehabilitación públicas para un mejor desarrollo económico, proyectos y subvenciones para regulación de viviendas, proyectos especiales para personas mayores de edad de, y de capacitados, provisiones de servicio público como abrigos, clínica y nutrición para personas mayores. Pagos que no sean federales, subvenciones, pagos de reliquias y asistencias, gestión de planificación y administración del programa. El pueblo de Walk Hill considera, eh, considera proyectos que sean enviados al programa 2024 Orange County Consortium Community Development hasta el 23 de junio del 2023. El pueblo de Walk Hill hará todo lo posible para garantizar que la audiencia sea accesible para personas con desventajas. Si necesita ayuda o asistencia esencial, por favor comuníquese con la secretaria municipal. 
Thank you, Donnie. With that, we'll go to the audience, step up, and just no uh, Mr. Supervisor, for the just note for the record that the notice is published in both English and Spanish uh, as provided uh, and required by law. And perhaps um, commissioner could, just before this public comment, give a quick summary of what this year's application might be for. Commissioner? Yes, good evening, thank you. Um, yeah, the um, what we commonly refer to as the CDBG, Community Development Grants, uh, we have been very successful over the past 15 or 20 years of receiving these grants on either an annual or a biannual basis from the County of Orange. Um, we've done numerous improvements to sidewalks, drainage. Um, we ended up putting a bathroom up at the Washington Heights Park. Uh, what we're applying for now actually is the 2024 funding. Um, and what we're going to do with that is we're going to be um, either relining through trenchless technology and or replacing uh, drainage in the northern woods section of the town. It's about a 30 year old uh, townhouse community over in the Mechanicstown area. And uh, this is a two year program. And we're pretty confident that hopefully we'll receive the full amount of funding, uh, the 175, because we've got very good luck with uh, not only receiving the funding, um, but actually yesterday there was a mandatory webinar that Michelle Baker, our grant administrator, sat through. And um, there's actually municipalities out there that have had funding from 2018, 2019, that have not completed their projects yet. We uh, have a very good track record of completing our projects, um, not only on time, but we use what's called forced labor, which is our own uh, internal uh, labor. And what that allows us to do, it allows us, it precludes us from prevailing rates. And we basically do about twice as much uh, work for about half the amount of money. So it works out very good. So thank you very much. Thank you. You step up and please identify yourself and address anyone in the audience. Hello oh, there. Uh, do you want a first and last name? Um, yes, please. I'm sorry, very new to this. I'm Matthew Tinfrichen. Do you need that spelled? It's a weird. I'm sorry, I'm very new to this. I uh, are you speaking regarding the public hearing? Is regarding the Yes, okay, I, I would propose uh, we need no turn on red signs on Route 211. Because the way it works, you have these little signs where there's a little white. Yes, I want to stop you. Yes, in the public okay. hearing, based on the public hearing we just opened up, you'll be able to speak on that in a little bit. I see. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Anyone on Zoom? Anyone in the audience? Okay. That being said, I make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Mr. Coyne? Yes. Mr. Valentin? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Supervisor Serrano? Yes. Next public hearing on creating a local, local chapter 196. I have the uh, Madam Clerk read the announcement. Notice is hereby given that there has been introduced before the town board of the town hall a local law entitled a local law creating chapter 196 short term rentals of the code in the town of Walkville. Please, please take notice that a public hearing will be held by the town board of the town of Walkville on March 23rd, 2023 at 7 20 Walkville Town Hall, 99 Tower Drive, Building A, Middle Town, New York, to consider the adoption. Of the aforesaid introductory local law. Any resident of the town of Walk Hill is entitled to be heard upon said proposed local law at such public hearing. Copies are available for review at Walk Hill Town Hall 99 Tower Drive, Building A. The town of Walk will make every effort to ensure the hearing is accessible to persons with disabilities. Anyone requiring special assistance and or reasonable accommodations should contact the town clerk by order of the town board of the town of Walk Hill, Louise and Gracia Town Clerk. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll note that the uh, notice of public hearing was published and posted in accordance with the uh, law. Thank you. Okay. So, you step up, please. State your name, address, and regarding one speech on this law. Hi, my name is Kelly Naughton. 
I'm from Naughton and Torrey, uh, which is in Goshen. I also live in the town of Walkup. This looks like a lot of notes I'm bringing up here, but it's not. Uh, I, I will submit a comment letter to the clerk for the board, uh, but I do want to address the board on a couple of issues just briefly. I'm here on behalf of the Sunstress. They're my clients. They've lived in this town for about 25 years. Uh, their property and their neighboring property or their neighbor's property, excuse me, are located in the RA district, which is your rural agricultural district. It's always been a, a quaint, peaceful part of town. You know, it's always been surrounded by farmland. And anyone who lives in a rural area would be familiar with the peace and the tranquility that that kind of that, that kind of neighborhood offers. Um, my clients have always cherished those essential elements of the rural lifestyle. Until about two and a half years ago, when their neighbor opened an illegal short-term rental uh, that's been operating, like I said, for about two and a half years. So during that time, we had sought assistance and enforcement from the town. And this law that's proposed, it falls short of that. Um, I'm not sure if the town board is aware, but the law for you is actually verbatim of the law that was presented and proposed in the village of Woodbury. And I can tell you that because I drafted it. This law, I drafted for the village of Woodbury. But Woodbury's law was tailored to the specific concerns, circumstances, and considerations of the village of Woodbury and the needs of that community. Woodbury hasn't adopted their law. It was introduced months ago, and they are making substantive and substantial changes to it based on the comments and the concerns that are being received. And, and we hope that this board does that as well. Well, Kill's a different community. You've got different concerns. You've got different circumstances. And I think we can all agree that a law needs to be tailored to the community that it's for. So like I said, there's just a couple of points that I want to raise. They'll be more fully described in my letter. But the first is that this law that's proposed permits short-term rentals, Airbnbs, Verbos, whatever you want to call it, in every district of the town where a single-family home is permitted. In every single-family home. So look to your left, look to your right. Those neighbors of single-family homes, those can be an Airbnb. The second point is that this law permits up to 12 overnight guests in those Airbnbs, short-term rentals. That's a lot of people for one house, but that's only the overnight guests. This law does not take into account the people that come and they don't stay over. There's nothing in this law that actually protects against the structure becoming an event venue. So this law is really putting the financial interests of just a few of your residents over that of your 29,000 plus residents, including the businesses that you have here that legally operate as event venues. Despite the purpose, one of the purposes of your zoning code, which specifically states that it is a, for the provision of privacy for families, how can families have that now? Because what you're doing is adding a use. The use of a single family residence as, a, as an STR is now introducing a new commercial business into your rural agricultural district and in all of your low density residential districts. The second thing, or the third thing actually, is that this law has been improperly classified under speaker. At your last meeting, when this was before you on March 1st, you classified it as an unlisted action. However, this changes the allowable uses by adding this use to more than 25 acres, which means it has to be a type one action. And a type one action under the law is considered to be more likely to have a significant adverse impact on the law. Again, every dwelling can be used as an STR. Can your town's infrastructure handle that? That's water, that's roads, that's sewer. I, I don't know that you've looked into that. And that's something that definitely needs further analysis on all areas of relevant environmental concern. The last point that I want to really bring up is that this law that's before you right now actually expands your current noise law. It's not consistent with the laws that you currently have. So to comply with this law, my clients would have to be quiet, not make noise that goes off the property at 10 p.m. But the party going on next door can continue for another hour. The neighboring property right now has already been rented out for parties and other events. And that's obviously going to happen on all other rentals that this occurs in in the town um, because it only limits it to 12 overnight guests again, which is a lot, but it does nothing to limit any of the events that are going to be held there. So we would respectfully request that you keep the public hearing open while the town revises its law to address wall kill specific issues 
and takes a hard look at the potentially adverse environmental impacts. And we would urge the town not to rush the process and to give this important law the attention that it deserves. Thank you. So, so before you leave, um, very interesting. And, and uh, you know, we have to start somewhere, obviously, because there's nothing right now um, that protects the residents in any kind of way. We don't have anything in regards to this this type of law. So we're starting somewhere, square one. Um, and it, I'm glad to see that we're starting with the author of, of the original. Um, where is Woodbury with your additions and additional changes? What stage are they in? They're still in the, they, they have scheduled a public hearing, but it has been adjourned for several months and not open because they're continuously getting comments. They referred it to the planning board and the planning board is issuing a long report for suggested revisions, the building department as well. So those changes all have to be made and incorporated before they want to give the public something more concrete to consider mm -hmm. and say, this is more along the lines from the starting point that we were at, which is, is posted online to this is how far we've come. Now, what do you think? And if they need to make more changes after that, they will. But and obviously, that's a purpose for the public here, right? It's to hear from the public, get the input from the public, and improve on what we currently have and currently what we're proposing. So I look forward to your to your um, comments, and and you said you were going to leave them with us. And I hope you leave your number in case we have questions. And that's right on here. And I'll uh, ask how many copies I brought flash because I wasn't sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. On Zoom. Anyone on Zoom? No. We don't have enough. We'll make up. Thank you, Kevin. Anyone else want to step up? Please state your name and address. This is regarding this public hearing. This is regarding the public hearing for the short term rentals. Yes. I know. Can you hear me? I had to come around here to uh, yes. this way we speak. And now for something completely different. Good evening, everybody. I'm an Airbnb owner, and I have a slightly different take on the proposed legislation. Your name, please, ma'am. My name is Catherine Stroll. I live at 407 in Gracia Road. I am a farmer, and I was a baker, but now I'm just a farmer. I'm the original in Gracia Farm. Nice to meet you all. You can help me. I don't think that the uh, short-term rental business is quite the wild west that uh, it's perceived to be by some people. I don't think it's quite the wild west. Uh, I know there's a variety of situations. I know there are bad neighbors in all shapes and forms, including long-term tenants and, and property owners. Um, I, it's not that I've been around the block a few times, but most Airbnb owners that I know are very heavily invested in protecting their uh, investment. They don't want their houses trashed. There's very strict rules about parties. And if there is a, a, a host on the platform that is hosting parties and destroying the neighborhood and they get a complaint, they will take them off the platform. I can't speak for the other platforms. Um, I do understand you want to have a permit system. I think some of these permits and things on this law are a little bit over the top. Um, you know, I mean, having, having a map, you know, you're talking about a house with three or four bedrooms. If your smoke detector is going off, is anybody going to really stop and look at that map and see where the front door is, or are they just going to run down the stairs and out the door? I mean, I think there could be a differentiation between uh, owners who are on the property or adjacent to the property and have one or two units than owners that are, are management companies running multiple units and are less personally involved. Those people may be some of the sources of the irritation. Uh, I haven't gotten any complaints from my neighbors, which I'm very pleased about. And I certainly don't want them disturbing me because I'm the neighbor most of the time I can't tell they're there. Uh, so I think maybe there could be some leeway in this law for small versus big and some things about the size of the house. I don't know 
uh, who you intend to have inspect those fire extinguishers between every guest. That could be quite an industry in the town of Walker, but that has to be done by an outside party. That could put us all out of business, the expense of that alone. Um, the uh, Airbnb owners, the property owners, we pay taxes. We keep our properties clean. We keep them in pristine condition or we couldn't stay in business. And there are children that stay there. They don't go to school. They're not a burden on the school system. And I don't think they're a burden on the environment. Uh, the nature of business in this area seems to be seasonal. Uh, we get most of our guests in the summertime coming for the town and county events and weddings. Weddings is a big thing. And Lego land a little bit. Um, but it's not, you know, we hardly booked it all in the winter. So you can't say that we're like putting stress on the environment year round. Uh, it is unfortunate there are thoughtless owners and it's unfortunate that there are thoughtless people. But I don't think we need to punish the conscientious owners with onerous and heavy duty requirements to appease for what's really a few bad apples. Would anybody like to ask me a question? <laughs> Well, I really appreciate your attention. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick. How long have you been doing this? Um, we have been doing it about a year and a half. Um, we we want to keep the pro we have bought two houses adjacent to our farm. Um, one of the houses yeah. is the birthplace of the very well respected Joe and Gracia, one of the original farmers there, also known as Uncle Pecky. And uh, the other house was also built by one of the original farmers and we wanted to restore them to the farm, but we're not millionaires. This isn't, by the way, Airbnb is not a get rich quick scheme either. There's plenty of expenses. And we do, we do give a lot of business to, to the local laundries, the local tradespeople, the plumbers, the electricians, the carpenters, the painters, uh, uh, you know, just keeping the houses up the way they should be. And but if you don't, Keep those houses nice, you can't stay in business. That's basically it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone on Zoom? Anyone in the audience? Hi, uh, Noni Kelly, 10 Laddie Road. Um, did you guys send out a public notice to our mailboxes regarding this public hearing? Are you required to? No. So how is the community at large supposed to know that this public hearing is happening unless they are very avid town followers and go on the website? Public hearing notice was posted and published as required by law. Where is it published? The record. Time show. Time show record? Uh, well, I would just recommend that maybe it's published in addition to that somewhere else. I know you're required by law to only do the time to a record, but it was also on the website. That's what I'm saying. But so, the, as a person in the community, not everybody goes onto your website, and, and most of the town, really, I'd say two thirds of the town does not read the time to record anymore because it's not much of a newspaper. <laughs> but 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 I understand you're required by law to do that. I'm I'm just saying that you know if you want community input. It's hard to get it if you not like you can put a sign out in front of the gallery that says you know you're going to have this public hearing. We have posting places within the town where it's also posted. Unfortunately, for something like this, we can't send a notice to every property in the town because that would be cost prohibitive. Every time the town wanted to adopt a local law, it'd be thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, it seems like they have to rethink this because a lot of people in the community do not know about this. And I don't have a pro or a con about this. I really don't. But it just seems like, wow. I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I don't, in the global sense, I don't disagree with you, ma'am. But the reality is that the public has access to the town's website and all of the public mm -hmm. hearing notices are placed on it. Not very transparent. I mean, you know, really, it's not. I just hope that, I mean, I know you're, you're doing what's required by law, and that's all you can do. I'm just saying that's my thoughts about it, and that's what I have to say. Okay, thank all you. right. Thank you. Thank you. That's a bit for justice, but I have to go on. It's important. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Klimstrom. My wife and I live in uh, 
rural agricultural zone in Circleville. And uh, we'd like to thank the board for addressing the issue of short term rentals in the town of Wallkill uh, and for allowing us to share our views. Our perspective is probably a little more finely tuned than that of the average resident who may not have had the experience with short term rentals uh, since our immediate uh, neighbors have been operating a short term rental in violation of the current town zoning laws for the past two and a half years. And our residential experience has been significantly impacted. We applaud some of the provisions in the introductory law, such as the requirements to ensure safety and provide for registration of the rental. However, the draft law is much more permissive than the existing zoning law. Specifically, it allows for short term rental in dwellings that are not owner occupied, and it permits up to 12 overnight renters, in contrast to the four that are permitted currently. The draft law also does not address the use of the short term rental properties for parties and other events. Speaking first of the requirement for owners to reside in the rental property. In our view, houses used exclusively for short-term rentals represent commercial businesses like any. The introduction of a commercial business into a residential or RA zone is not in keeping with the community nature of these neighborhoods. We purchased a home in this country setting to enjoy the peace and tranquility of a farming and residential community and wonder if we're under the impression that the town code would protect us from being surrounded by commercial properties. Need for legislation to introduce safety requirements for short-term rentals should be independent of the right for residents of these zones to be free from adjacent commercial enterprises. Additionally, short-term rental to unsupervised guests greatly increases the risk of disruptive behavior, trespassing on our property, and other annoyances. It should not be the responsibility of the neighbors of these businesses to police the behavior of unsupervised renters. The number of renters is another significant factor. The noise and disruption from larger groups of eight to 12 people is exponentially greater than for smaller groups. And this is irrespective of the capacity of the rental dwelling. A party atmosphere naturally develops when large groups congregate at a resort-like property and engage in activities that, while maybe appropriate for folks on vacation, are disruptive to the peace and tranquility of the neighborhood. This is not the same thing as having a family of neighbors using their property next door. Neighbors may also occasionally congregate outdoors, have boisterous parties or activities like tennis, basketball, swimming, but they're neighbors. You know them. You have a friendly relationship with them and develop mutual respect and assistance. Well, I may take some iced tea over to a sweaty group of neighbors playing tennis and chat for a while, a group of transient renters engaged in the same activity is simply a nuisance. Short-term renters have no incentive to be neighborly. These issues are only amplified if parties and events are allowed. The lack of restriction in the current law is major oversight. Parties can get out of control. They can create significant noise and have the potential to become dangerous. In 2020, Airbnb banned parties at rental houses. In 2021, 6,600 people were suspended for violating this ban. Nonetheless, a quick internet search revealed that since April of last year, there have been seven shootings in Airbnb parties with more than 26 individuals shot, some fatally. And in case you think these events cannot happen in our communities, in 2022, the town of Clarkstown, which is here in New York, bans short-term rentals after a shooting at a short-term rental in New City. Now, I know that these are anecdotal, but we don't want to become an anecdote. Why do we need to introduce these risks and annoyances into our communities? The proposed law would benefit a remarkably small constituency. I can find about 30 Airbnb listings in the town of Wallfield currently, while having a negative impact on the 30,000 town residents who do not operate short-term rentals. In addition to the erosion of the enjoyment of residential property due to encroachment of new commercial uses, the property values for those living next to short-term rentals will suffer who would choose to move into such a situation. So while we applaud the effort to specifically consider the regulation of short-term rentals, we urge the board to reconsider the current draft law. We ask at a minimum to retain the current zoning law requiring owner occupancy at the time of the rental, with a cap of four renters at a time and a prohibition on parties, weddings, and other events involving addition and business. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone on the zone? 
anyone in the audience? Go ahead. Okay, so um, we've been living next to a whole house, five bedroom, up to 12 renter, short term rent rental um, that's not owner occupied, operating illegally under the current zoning laws since fall of 2020. Additional businesses have participated there, including yoga instructors. So 10 to 12 people, it's a really, really large and loud group, even, even if you haven't experienced this, you know when you go into a restaurant, you don't want to sit next to the party of eight or 10 or 12. You want to sit from that. How about trying to do that every night for going out to dinner? So the owner has also added daytime and evening events with additional guests not staying over, including at times around 30 cars in their parking area. We've had significant disruption. They have a pool and a tennis court. The tennis court is very close to our house. And um, it's essentially like living in a loud party resort with um, very close to our outdoor living spaces. The owner's not on site and I'm not even home at times. And these, these renters disrupt our residential life. They have shown up on our porch. They have taken their roller suitcases up to our porch despite signs. They trespass on our property without regard, including on Christmas Eve. We've had a lot of loud music that can start anytime after 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. They allow dogs. There have been dogs barking and barking intermittently at all hours and running on our property. There have been unsupervised children on the tennis court swearing and fighting as early as 7 a.m. We've had food delivery people trying to give us food. We've had pool people trying to collect money from us when they weren't home. Um, we've had people in our driveway for promotional videos for yoga. Uh, and that when the owner is not on site, it's fallen to us to really try to deal with these things. There's been a bachelorette party that the police have documented at the town of Wall Hill's request, a graduation party, a wedding shower. There's a large commercial event where vendors try to deliver the rental items to our house and things like this. So I think you get the flavor. So in summary, we are long time, 25 plus year residents of the town of Wall Hill in the rural agricultural zone. We restored a historic home. We did not anticipate living adjacent to what has now become, you know, become a vacation resort. When the owners are not on premise, with unsupervised guests, loud parties, vacation resort-like atmosphere, safety concerns with strangers, trespassing concerns, transient and intrusive guests with little regard for their neighbors, with us, and disruptive holidays among the many disturbing issues that accompany such a business. We believe that such a business is at odds with the peaceful residential nature of our community, which we so value and treasure. And in some residential neighborhoods, it should be just that, for the permanent residents. I ask you to imagine that your closest neighbor moved out of their house and started hosting different groups of people, 10 to 12 at a time, every week. People who are on vacation and would party on the property. Would this not have an adverse impact on your quality of life? Thank you. Thank you. So, you want the audience? I believe Javier Morales would want to speak on this. Yeah. 
Uh, it was on uh, Zoom. Yeah, right. Javier, do you want to speak? Hi, guys. How's it going? So my name is Javier Morales, and I am from a company called Granicus. Um, what we do here at Granicus is we help track, monitor, and for um, short-term rentals for town, cities, and municipalities. Uh, we work with several um, municipalities, counties, and cities in New York right now in regards to you know, the tracking monitoring aspect of short-term rentals, we've come across, like, listening to the story that was just proposed um, about party houses, stuff like that, kind of nuisance, Airbnbs and whatnot. Um, we actually do have a hotline that's 24-7 in regard to contacting the hosts themselves, because we do find the information like that and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just kind of making here listening on what kind of stories you guys have brought to the table in regards to short-term rentals, because I'm very curious on what some of the big issues are. I just got into this meeting. I'm sorry, I'm late, but I'm more curious to see like more uh, people's opinions on short-term rentals and see how we at Granicus can help you guys out in regards to the nuisance um, Airbnbs and, and such. Yeah, I I don't think we've ever met Ms. Morales, but your company sounds very interesting. I would suggest and recommend that maybe you call the supervisor's office and set up um, a visit into our work session, and we can see what you have to offer and, and see if, if we can use your services and help us along with this. Very interesting. I provided yeah. the board his contact information as well as all the information to reach out in terms of the supervisor reaching out and setting up a meeting. He contacted me. I told him we had a public hearing tonight and that he should stop by and, and let us know um, what part of, you know, creating a law like this in terms of short-term rentals is identifying the short-term rentals. You know, I mean, we are relying right now on people coming forward and getting permits and all that type of stuff. But the, this company, which is working with the county, which uh, is in negotiation and contracting with the county, um, could help identify that for the town and help some of these nuisance complaints that people are complaining about and ensure that the short-term rentals are being regulated once a law is in place and ensure it's per permitted properly, as well as ensuring that uh, it's being taxed appropriately and ensuring that they're in the right area. So. Um, you know, that was the reason for them wanting to uh, stop by. Thank you, sir. Okay, hi, I'm Bradley Stroll from 407 Ingrassio Road. Uh, you've heard from my wife before, we're farmers. The, the properties are all in the Ag District. What we're trying to provide for the people who come is a country-like setting. Uh, the house prior to uh, turning it into an Airbnb had 15 people living in it with a swimming pool and all kinds of stuff going on all the time. Uh, that has ceased since it became a, an Airbnb. Uh, as far as the number of people in the house, yes, there could be 10, there could be 12. Most of the time, it's a generational thing. It's the grandparents and, and, and their parents and the grandchildren. Uh, most of these people are not looking to uh, drink beer and have a wild party. Uh, I also am curious, what is the difference because this proposed law has nothing to do with bed and breakfasts. How does a bed and breakfast differ from uh, an Airbnb? Bed and breakfast, yeah, I believe you just, you're renting a room. It's kind of like renting a, a hotel room, and except you get breakfast in the morning. Um, these Airbnbs are homes, that, you know. Yes. You know, you rent the home and you, you know. Well, I have in the past, when I have traveled in Maine and New Hampshire, rented a, uh, uh, a bed and breakfast where we rented the entire house. Okay. And they made, who made the breakfast? Uh, <laughs> who made the breakfast? They left us frozen waffles, frozen omelets, <laughs> yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we made the breakfast, but they left it for us. When I was over in Ireland, I stayed in the bed and breakfast. I, I thought it was great. I got up in the morning and I had, you know, breakfast. They made you breakfast. I thought it was, that's, that was my interpretation of a, a bed and breakfast. You know what I mean? So, it, and, and you rented a room. Um, so that's the way I view it, unless I'm wrong. I don't know, but I don't. Do that's that. a difference I see. You know, okay. 
That's all. Okay. But Airbnb doesn't have to be considered an evil word. No. That's all I got. No, and, and you know, it's going to wait until everybody was done, but you know, we're truly having a public hearing because we truly want help from the public. Um, 10, 15 years ago, these weren't what they are today, right? They weren't as prevalent. Uh, we have nothing in our code to address it. There are issues that pop up and we got to deal with it. So if we can have a public hearing, come up with a law, make it beneficial for the owner of the properties, the residents that neighbor them, you know, a win-win for everybody. We can't just ignore it though. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I mean, I know it's another disaster story and they're far and few between they are, but what could potentially take place? Uh, one municipality local to us, I won't mention it. Uh, somebody rented out a, uh, an Airbnb for their daughter. She put it on social media that she was going to have a party, right? Once it goes on social media, I mean, my God, that goes all over the place. So you've got all these kids coming from out of town, and uh, you know, some 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 things happen to some young people at that party. Um, now I get that they're far and few between, but if if we can address this and trying to and try to try to, uh, you know, minimize the opportunity of something like that. I think that's a good thing. So, yeah. Okay. When when you have somebody book with you from Airbnb, you have the option to be, to uh, decline their, their booking. Right. And we ask them questions. What do you, what is your purpose of coming to Middletown? Why are you coming here? What, what's, you know, what's your purpose? And if they give us an answer that you know is is, is big or or, or or snotty, sorry, not renting you the house. I mean, we, we screen the people very carefully. Forget the law; we don't want our house turned into garbage. So we want to be very careful who who is you know in the house. I mean, the the, the first time we rented, we had a lady. Her name was Molly. This lady was the lady from hell. I thought she stole the TV. She took the TV and carried it into a different room. I mean, I was like, I was shocked. I was like, do I really want to do this? But everybody else has been great, no problem. I mean, we have repeat customers, and uh, none of my neighbors have ever had a, a, a negative comment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just one comment. Um, what we're hearing tonight, and, and the purpose of this public hearing is obviously to get everyone's feedback and opinions. Um, we have the straws that just spoke that they own the area, they own and they live there and they have controls and they, they're watchful eyes. Then we have, unfortunately, um, David and his wife in Circleville that they live next to the, the exact opposite of what you're running. So hopefully between the two, we can find that workable medium. You know, there are those people that, that have it, that live there and control. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that, that David's wife, Cyber, suggested was um, owners should live at the unit. They should be limited. They should be certain controls there. If those controls are not there, and and the people that are not residents that own but just want to make the buck on it will will impact and continue impacting our our neighbors and residents. So we're trying to avoid that, and we're trying to find what works best. And I think that it, it's in the right direction. I look forward to. Um, Ms. Norton's um, notes and additions to what we have today. I think this is this is a great start, and and we can certainly add to it where the neighbors are not going to be impacted. Um, there's no reason why someone has been living in their house for 25 years or or, or less, and there's a change in the neighborhood or, or the house next door that their whole life gets turned upside down. Um, I think you folks are, are the exception. Hopefully that moving forward, there'd be more people that, that live there and own it and care for it. So that's the goal. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to add a few things. I mean, it's sitting here quietly listening uh, and understand that public hearing is just that. It's a hearing for the public to come and speak. There's no intention to vote on this tonight and close it. It's the very first step to gather information. 
So the one lady said that you know, she didn't feel it was very transparent. Well, please tell your friends and anybody else that you know that this will be open again next month. And well, we saw that for written comments all the time. Um, you know, because again, we're trying to do the best thing for the residents of the town as well as you know people who have businesses. Um, there's got to be a a way that everybody can coexist. Um, and I think you know, from what I'm hearing, um, having a background in zoning and stuff, it, it, there's something happening at house that's designed for residential living and it's not residential living and it's kind of out of our code right it's against our zone you can't have a house where you can host events in an ra zone or you know residential zone that's like a commercial entity so if you're going to have something where you're going to host parties and weddings and things like that that really doesn't belong in a residential area um, if people want to rent the house to, to live in the house and you know get away from wherever they are or they're in their way on their travels and they're stopping for a night or two, you know, obviously they're sleeping and eating just like everybody else lives in the neighborhood, right? That would be the goal to have something like that happen. So uh, again, this is um, a law that our attorney grabbed for us to draft. And you know, we have it out there for you guys to look at and make comments on. This is great that we're getting these comments because this is what we want. This is what a public hearing is for. It's to hear from the public um, and allow for back and forth and come up with something again that hopefully everybody is satisfied with. So please understand there's no, you know, don't feel like we're doing something shady because that's not what we would ever do. We're here to hear from you, listen to you, whether you're from the side of the renter. Um, you know, the business owner or the neighbor, clearly we have to listen to everybody's concerns, you know, and that's what this is about. So, you know, again, anytime you have comments, you can send them in, you can email, you can call any of us, we're all in councilmen from all the wards, representing the supervisor, representing the whole town, and you can reach out to any one of us and please do so. And so we can come up with a draft that works and makes everybody happy. So I just want you to understand that. Thanks. Anyone in the audience? My name is Charles Thompson. Uh, I live at 230 Huffcut Road, and I am a property owner of 347 Huffcut Road, which is the property that sits behind the Clemsters. Uh, I'd just like to explain a little bit that the property was subdivided years ago. It was property that I was born and raised on 68 years ago, so I've been here a little longer than everybody. So I guess I'm going to start. Um, it's kind of a unique situation. The property that we own is an L-shaped lot. So our property owners in front of us uh, from the road, you can't see our house. Uh, it sits on five acres, 5.1 acres. Um, at the time <clears throat> we started renovating it, we contacted the town and contacted the building inspector and uh, inquired about a permit. Um, so we got a permit to do what we wanted to do with the house. And at that time, there was no law on the book for short-term rentals, only for Airbnbs. So we now know the difference. Um, as far as deliveries to the property, yes, it could be, a, it was a problem. We did put up a sign for 347 Cut Road, all approved by the town. The inspector's been out. Uh, he's approved all the permits that we've had. So we're good to go as far as the town is concerned, as far as the building codes and the uh, code enforcer. Um, one of the parties that we had at the house, which was in September, uh, was my wife's birthday party. And I don't really think there's anything wrong with having your wife's birthday party, number 70, on your property. It, it ceased at 10 o'clock, just like our rules call for. Um, and I know that was made a comment about, but I think you have a right to do what you, what you want to do with your property. And if we don't do a short-term rental and we sell that property, is open to be sold to somebody that could have eight children, that could have motorbikes, go-karts, four-wheelers, and ride in a little recreation all hours of the day. There also is a second house in that property, which is currently abandoned. Nobody's been living there for the last 10 or so years. But if 
both of those houses were occupied by families, I still don't think my neighbors would be happy with the noise that would be created for those two houses. So um, I think we spent a lot of effort on the uh, <clears throat> Lois, and I appreciate your effort into that. And uh, we look forward to that road. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone on Zoom? Anyone in the audience? <laughs> Very good. Um, Morales. Am I allowed to speak? Is this a good time? Yes. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure. Um, so just just wanted to adding on to what the conversation has been going on. Since you guys are in the middle of drafting laws, voting on these uh laws and such, um we do offer consultation services through Grant Granicus when it comes to best practices. We've been working in this industry for, I don't know, about 10 plus years now. Our consultant's been working with short-term rentals for 20 plus years now. Um, he's been in the industry for a very long time and has seen the worst and the best when it comes to laws. So if you guys are open to it, if the supervisor and the councilman are open to it, I would like to um, get them in contact with uh, our good friend, Jeffrey Goodman. He, is, You guys can look him up online. He has been working in, in the short-term rental industry when it comes to constructing um, laws, bylaws, all that kind of fun stuff in regards to having the host and the public um, coexist peacefully. Um, because it seems like there's a little bit of tension on both sides in regards to making sure everybody is heard. Um, so I would just like to suggest that because he has been working in this industry for a very, very long time. He's seen the best and he's seen the worst, and he has very good opinions about how to draft a good law that is good for both sides equally. Thank you, Mr. Morales. If you can contact my office, um, if you're ready to take my phone number. Yes, uh, I have a pen and paper right here. Just let me know. Three, four, five. Six nine two seven eight three two seven eight two. Perfect. Uh, I will give you a call tomorrow. We can uh, set up a time to talk about that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Anyone else in the audience? With that being said, um, I make a motion to keep the meeting open. Public hearing. Public hearing opens the next two weeks. No, just keep it just keep it open yeah. without the yeah. hearing. Okay. I'll make a motion to keep it open indefinitely. Second by Councilman Johnson. Mr. Point? Yes. Mr. Valentin? Yes. Mr. Fire? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Supervisor Sawyer? Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do you have a card? I can. I have her contact info. Okay, good evening. So, this is Women History Month, and one of the reasons that I want to recognize the women. The contribution of women throughout the, uh, throughout the years have, have often gone unappreciated for dying in every year. However, in March, 
which is Women History Month, the time for reflection, appreciation, and celebration. What does it mean? It means celebrating women's accomplishment and the contributions they have made to the life of everyone for the better. Most women encourage. They encourage not only women, but also men in the community they live in. It has been observed annually in the month of March in the U.S. of 1987. And it's important to tell the wall to recognize the great contribution that we have of women in the town. Now, I know everyone says, oh, it's just a month. We try to do it all year round. Because if you look around, there are a lot of strong women here. And every man up here says, behind them is a strong woman. I believe I have a strong woman at home who allows me to do this. So my wife is not here. And probably said I'm too busy doing this. And I thank her for allowing me to do something I love. With that, we're going to start with a couple of uh, points. So the first one we're going to recognize is a woman who has been working for the town for a good number of years. And anytime I go to her, the first thing, uh, hi, supervisor, what do you need? I, I love that. What do you need? Willing to help. She by herself ran the planning a couple of years until we gave her a clerk to help her. And with that, Rudy Charles. Thank you, Sean. And everyone who's going to recognize today also got a certificate from Assemblywoman Gunther, who also um, is celebrating um, Women's History Month. <laughs> I really thought she was going to bring someone else, like little. She was going to bring a little baby to the house. Oh, yeah. Yes. Next, uh, Another kind of walk employee, who fortunately, is going to retire soon. And she's been with the town over 15 years, has done a tremendous job. And again, when I walk over to the assessor's office, I look, she's there with a smile, drinking coffee, happy. Um, and she's worked very hard in that department. We're going to miss you, but I don't think you're going too far. With that, Susan Um, if you notice on the other side of uh, Town Hall, we have what we call the Little Free Library, where we have books. Um, this was here when I got here, and we are looking to expand it to go to the other side of the building. So if anyone comes into Town Hall, they want to take a book. Um, and, um, Susan Doyle, who's in charge, has done a tremendous job. And we're looking to increase that little library 
because it's not like having a nice book to read. So she's not here today. Thank you. Next, we have president of the town of Walker Hill Senior Group. I had the opportunity to meet over the, over the last um, 18 months, and she has done a tremendous job with our seniors now that everything is open. Um, you go down there and see them play bingo. And I told her, I'm going to go down there and play bingo. I'm afraid that they're going to take all my money, all the seniors. But um, uh, Rosemary Massa, thank you very much for everything. Yes. <laughs> Next, we have a young lady who has been a tremendous help to Town of Walkill. And, you know, over the years, I've always said that the Gallery of Mall has been a tremendous neighbor, to a tremendous partner to the town of Walker and the community. And one of the main force behind that is the Gallery of Moore Marketing Director. Helped us on the 250th anniversary event parade. Right now is helping us plan on Juneteenth event in the mall. With that, call on the uh, All I want to say is thank you to the board, the staff of the town of Walk Hill, and uh, the employees of the town supervisor. It truly is a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say a special thank you to Carlos. He's done an amazing job. He really helped during the pandemic with the friendly visitor program. And doing food collection at the gallery at um the friendly visit program it was great it's done a lot of stuff so I really want to thank you next we have a young lady that I met a couple of months ago and the things that they have done her and her husband in regards to um prostate cancer and you know again um, this is the people who are women who are doing things in our community. She's the co-founder of CHAI Support Services. And with that, Karen Abrams. I wanted to say about my mom, we do a lot of good things for people. And, and my mom's the best mom ever. I would like to say thank you to the entire board, um, to you, Mr. Serrano, for opening the doors of the community for us to come. Um, my husband and I, we started this organization because he went through prostate cancer at early age, no symptoms, and we decided to bring you know, uh, something to the community. Uh, men don't talk about prostate cancer and that's a situation. Uh, people think that this is an elderly age situation, but it's not. They have been found cases of men uh, as young as 38 years old going to prostate cancer. The numbers are going up. And we want to say thank you so much 
to all of you for the support. We were here last year, and we hope to come back, and we hope to see all of these faces. If you haven't yet, it's a blood sample. Okay, it's only a blood sample. Tell your friends, and we hope we can work together again this year, and with all of you, and see each of you coming because I know you came and you did, and thank you for that. Because we have to bring more of these events to the community. If they, um, you know, if the men came, you know, they go to work, they're busy, but you have to think about your health. You have to think about your family because I want my husband around. And yesterday we celebrated 23 years together. And this is what we want to live with. So every child to have a grandfather there, there for them. Every, every family to have their parent, their brother. And if you have any history of cancer in your family, I just really encourage you to tell your doctor and take a test because with early screening, we can do something. Because when it's, you know, too advanced, unfortunately, sometimes the case is, you know, too late. But thank you so much. If I go on and on and on. <laughs> but thank you so much for what gives me the life. The running dog. Thank you. A lot of passion. Passion in what she does. How about the little guy? Let's give him a little hand. <laughs> okay. Next, um, listen to the radio in the morning for radio, and there is a voice on there that if you need it, the, 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 the so joy that comes out of. Um, this woman's voice when she's on the radio every morning. I've had the opportunity to go on the radio with her, and it's been phenomenal. I love it. Um, we're going to go on the radio with her. And she also does a lot of volunteer. One of the main things she volunteers for is the Earth Day cleanup. So that we are having Earth Day cleanup in the fall coming up next month. And this weekend, we're having a summit where we are bringing in. Uh, the community, the businesses, uh, who are all stakeholders in our town. Um, Kate Brandon, but she's not here today, but accepting in her honor is Michelle Taylor, who is on the radio in the afternoon. I have something to read. All right. Just going to get the gap. No. And this is on behalf of Kate Brennan. She said, Thank you so much for this recognition. It's a pleasure to work with all the wonderful organizations that make the Hudson Valley such a great place to live. She has fun every day at work, and we do in radio. We know we do. We get to do serious work, though. And Mall Radio allows her to lend the strength of the radio station to so many important causes. And she's very grateful each and every morning that she can go. She loves it. Um, and she said that she bought a new pair of work gloves and she can pick up those kind of trash to provide her. Yeah, next month. Yes. All right? Yes. So, so thank you, everybody. On behalf of Kate Brandon and everybody at Mall Radio, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we'll be out there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I don't see our next two recipients. Is Iris Cora, who owns Pecorino Pizza, small business owner in the town of Walkill, um, who has great food. And again, you know, they're willing to help the community. Um, but she's not here today. Congratulations to her. Next, um, I don't believe they're here either. Um, I'm going to attempt to say her name. 
Swat, Swat Sally Doki. I think I already messed it up. She, um, <laughs> appreciate it. she is the owner of Endera's Kitchen, um, right across from um, the Starbucks. And he, again, another community based, we want to tell the community um, she was able to help about at the Kawana celebration and she was able to provide food for us at the event of the community. So that is who we are recognizing for. Um, history, Women History Month, and then we have something special today. Um, our neighbor, Donna Crawford, um, a had a celebration. Donna Walker, of course, had a celebration last year when we were 250th. April 7th is our birthday, will be 251. So um, they are celebrating the bicentennial, and we're going to do a resolution recognizing that. And we also have a certificate and um, accepting in their honor is county legislator Ron Sassy. Well, I believe this is kind of far from the story. First and foremost, uh, congratulations to all the ladies here in the town of Wolfville. I know they played a very, very important role. I'm glad to see them recognized. Thank you. And on behalf of Supervisor Carl Carnes and the Crawford Town Board, I'm here tonight to uh, accept this uh, proclamation or this uh, certificate recognizing our bicentennial. And yes, I am also the acting town historian. I have been in contact with your historian over here, Mr. Dosworthy. Who told me I had an hour to speak tonight? <laughs> <laughs> if everyone can just stick around a little bit, um, our story. Um, has a historic moment um, that he wants to share with the audience. And he said, I don't want to run out. So uh, you can just stay here for a minute while he does his three minutes. Three minutes? Okay. Say three minutes. And, you know, that would, you know, you say three minutes. That's like a cheat. We're going to have a five minute meeting and that's 45 minutes. Okay. Hi, everybody here, and I'm Zoom. I'd like to see everybody there. I'm Tom Nasri, the uh, town historian, and also with us tonight is the assistant historian, Jim Vandershaft, and former assistant, Gwen Chisverto. Uh, I have three items tonight. One very short. Uh, not one of them. Not one of them comes from this 1881 history of Orange County, which ironically does not include Middletown, because when they wrote this in 1881, Middletown was only a village, not a city. And I'll give you a few more words on that in a minute. Uh, the first item that I like to just mention. Uh, regarding the uh, Middletown, that the, at the time, Middletown was a village in the town of Walker. Villages are not separate sovereign entities. They are part of the town, mostly through the budget process, but can also share things like police department and the highway department. Cities are sovereign, but cannot have villages. Just for a little history information. Uh, for the next item, in 1888, Middletown became a city. But before that, in 1889, a trolley was planned for electric power. In 1883, construction started on the Middletown Goshen Traction Company. 1894, construction completed and Midway Park opened down by the Gulf. Now, uh, generally, <coughs> trolley companies opened uh, parks 
for people to go to so they could pay their nickel for the fare. And they made a lot of money that way. In 1899, the trolley was reorganized as the Middletown Bozeman Railway Company. But when it first started up and it was proposed in uh, 1870, it was a town of Walkville, but it never went anywhere until they constructed it later. In 1905, it became the Walkville Transit Company. In 1924, with the advent of motor vehicles, it reduced revenue and it, the trail, trolley closed forever. Now, just in regard to the, of Middletown, why is it Middletown and what happened to Walkville on your address? Everything you get in the mail is Middletown. Well, why all, all the mail in the town of Walkville is just the Middletown? They are completely two different municipalities. Now, before 1888, they were the same. Then Middletown became a separate city. Also, it does not help that the boundaries are so confusing between Walkville and Middletown. Even Congressman Ben Gilman could not get to the post office to recognize the town of Walkville because the actual post office building is in Middletown. The mail goes to the Middletown building. And then the post office redistributes it because they know where all the roads are in the town and the city. Uh, the post office did add a zip code, Walkville, on the east side of Route 17. But the zip code 10941 is managed by 10940. Milton. And the next item I have in regards to the St. Patrick's Day coin beef lunch for seniors, I think you guys did a great job. Putting, putting that off. We had a good, a good turnout, uh, including left times. You might even know a couple of old left times. <laughs> but, uh, somebody, somebody knows. <laughs> now, speaking of leprechauns, did you know leprechauns are so old, they remember when rainbows were black and white. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I don't Yes, very good. Thank you. Oh, like that one. Uh, we have public participation three minutes on agenda items only. The one in the audience. Anyone on Zoom? Bye. Anyone in the audience? Okay. Madam Clerk, do we have any correspondence? No. Thank you. With that, we'll start with the resolutions. Resolution of the town board of the town of Walker authorizing the supervisor to accept the post in the rehabilitation of the Inwood and Tower Drive B storage, water storage tanks. Resolved that the town, sorry, resolved that the recommendation of Pitt and Barrel and the consulting engineer, the town board hereby authorizes and directs the town board the supervisor of the to accept the proposal for the rehabilitation of the Inwood and Tower Drive B water storage tanks. From TAM Enterprises in the amount of one million nine hundred sixty-eight thousand two dollars. Resolved that the town supervisor is designated is hereby authorized to execute any and all documents to effectuate acceptance of said bid subject to the approval of the town manager. These improvements will be funded through the project budget line HT 18310.4616. So second. Mr. Coyne. Yes. Mr. Valentin. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Supervisor Saran. Yes. 
Resolution of the Town of the Town of Walker recognizing the Town of Crawford by the candidate. Have a motion. So moved. Second. Board on that one. Seconded by the entire board. Mr. Coyne? Yes. Mr. Valentin? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Supervisor Serrano? Yes. Resolution of the Town of the Town of Morgan authorizing the submission of the grant application for the Orange Urban County Consortium Community Development Program for the year 2024. Resolved that it approved the Town Supervisor as designated is hereby authorized and directed to execute and deliver any and all contract documents, including but not, not limited to an intermunicipal agreement with the County of Orange for fiscal year 2024, Orange Urban County Consortium Community Development Program. And motion. So moved. Second. Mr. Coyne. Yes. Mr. Mellis. Yes. Mr. Meyer. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Supervisor Serrano. Yes. Resolution of the Town of the Town of Walkville authorizing the Town Supervisor executing outside vendor contract for information technology services. Resolve the town where the town of Walker here by all this is the town supervisor and says it means to execute contract with Edmonds to furnish renewal access licenses for the town hall email server, town hall file server and the police department terminal server for a total sum of $5,474. In accordance with the proposal annexed here to along with any other appropriate documents to be the consent of this resolution, all of which are subject to review and approval by the town attorney. Madam, motion. So moved. Second. Second. Mr. Coyne. Yes. Mr. Valentin. Yes. Mr. Meyer. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Supervisor Serrano. Yes. Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk. Next, we start with the councilman. To my right, Councilman Meyer. Each week, the town approves what it calls warrants of the town. Warrants are billed the town pays to its vendors. This process starts way before the board approves them at a meeting. It starts with the procurement policy, ensuring that the bills are audited by the town controller and that the correct amounts are being charged to the correct accounts. All board members have a fiduciary responsibility to protect taxpayer money and assets. As late as the end of last summer, when I reviewed the warrants against bills, it was clear expenses weren't charged against correct accounts, the warrant wasn't always audited prior to board approval, and money used to pay bills didn't always come out of the correct accounts, to name a few of the irregularities. There were any number of errors and gaps in Roles, including that no one was signing off and approving a consultant and legal fees being charged to the town, an important step to ensure that the town is receiving full value for the services being rendered. We received multiple warnings from various accounting firms and the state controller's office. The new controller has done an excellent job in restructuring the department and moving the department in the right direction. She has created procedures for purchasing as well as reviewing and approving those purchases, including segregation of duties and review to minimize mistakes and errors. These procedures were only provided to the board three weeks ago for review. However, with the turnover in the department, which now includes this controller, this is an important to have policies and procedures and proper oversight to ensure the progress we've made to date isn't lost when she leaves and someone new comes in. The warrant review policy is a temporary control put in place until the board could establish a proper internal control in accordance with the O'Connor Davies report recommendation, recommendations I propose to adopt in November of 2021. This would include a warrant audit policy, fixed asset inventory policy, cash deposit management policies, custody of asset policy, capital project policies, payroll policies, and other policies needed by the town. To date, the only accounting policies presented to me by the supervisor was an outdated procurement policy last updated in 2004, an investment policy which the town I think started following, and recently the board passed a fund balance policy. In May of 2022, in January of 2023, the board authorized the supervisor to engage an outside accounting firm to create these policies throughout the town. Each time the supervisor indicated he was discussing an engagement letter. To date, 
This has not been done, and there have been no discussions from the supervisor about it. In February, based on the comptroller's preliminary findings, the town instructed the supervisor again to engage an outside firm to examine the town's payroll in more detail. When I followed up with the supervisor last week, I was informed this has not been done yet. Policies and laws are only good if they're being followed. My abstentions are not because I don't want to pay the bills, but because we need to establish proper policies and procedures and adhere to them. Otherwise, why should the public have any confidence in a board that refuses to follow the rules? Mr. Serrano indicated he attended the same comptroller classes that I did in the city. And in each class, they discussed the importance of policy and internal controls. There was even a specific class devoted to internal controls of the procurement, where they spoke about warrant audit policy and an entire class about board reporting. I even brought back the books from the state comptroller's office, which I provided for the board and the public for review. So why is the supervisor acting like he doesn't know about any of this or that it's not necessary? We have had years to implement best practices, and there are two accounting policies, and both aren't being adhered to in its entirety. Even the comptroller's office, still at town hall after 10 months, the supervisor and board are content with waiting until the report is issued rather than making this a priority. After all, it's only taxpayer money, right? A proper tone needs to be set from the top. It is the responsibility of the board to set policies and establish a good working control environment and to ask questions. Details matter. Everything else is just an excuse, and an excuses accomplish nothing. It's time to stop making excuses and just get the job done. In addition, I want to publicly thank Lucrezia Anderson for all her hard work and wish her the best in her next endeavor. I want to congratulate everybody who got awards tonight. Um, it's a great honor, and we love to honor the, the people who do great works in the town. The corned beef and cabbage lunch was an amazing event. Gary did a great job again. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, yeah, let's give let, let's give Gary a hand. Thank you, Gary. Great job. And uh, and thank you very much. Thanks. So hang on a second. So Neil, did you vote on the warrants when Frank was the supervisor? And if so, why? Why did you stop voting on them when George became supervisor? We why did you? Okay. okay. I got a question. It's very hang on. Hang on. Why did you tell Councilman Johnson as soon as the election was over out in the parking lot, in the police station, when we were handing out the. Uh, the uh, COVID testing kits that you were going to spend two years. Your sole purpose was to spend two years trying to take all of us down. You know, you've been nothing but partisan. Nothing. And we've all sat up here like a gentleman while you rip into us month after month. Nobody wants to hear it, man. Can I, can I, can I respond? No. No, no, I was asking questions. You said for me to respond, so I'm going to respond to the question. I'm going to answer the question, so let me respond, please. First of all, I never said that, so I'm not sure where that's coming from. You weren't a party to the conversation, Mr. Coyne, so I would respectfully say you shouldn't be repeating something that you were not a party to. And second of all, second of all, right, the warrant policy, right, had been passed in September. Okay, we hadn't even started it until December. December. There was one vote in December about approving the warrants. That was it. That was the only approval of the warrants was in December that Frank was in. And I had reviewed the warrants at that point in time and they looked fine. However, after that, we found out that there were errors coming through on the warrants, that they were not audited, that sign-offs were not being done properly, Things were not being coded to the right accounts. So at that point in time, I decided that it needed to stop, that we needed to make changes to ensure that the proper controls were in place so that we all were getting the right information and that the right information was being put into the system. Proper controls are clear and the comptroller's office guidance is clear. So I'm not sure why there's such stubbornness in actually just implementing them. If you just implement them, then you won't have to worry about me talking about it anymore. That's it. We 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 went through this. Okay. Three times already. 
Right. Three times. And, and, and they are the one who made the one run. We authorized the supervisor to hire somebody. In January of 21, we authorized the supervisor to hire somebody. I to I would like to understand why it's not being done. The board is authorizing something, then the well, that means that everybody should do it. We all have to say it. You're a gentleman, if you can't be a gentleman, do not speak. Simple as that. I'm asking you to answer the question. Well, please answer the question. There's constant turnover. Okay, you need the bodies to have the procedures work. I'm okay, okay. that's an excuse. Okay. Thanks. 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 So, Councilman Meyer, you, you're making this a thing here. This is like a great stage for like five minutes. It's not. <laughs> so, the so, actual question yeah. Didn't I actually tweet something in the last year to help me with the policy? Yes, yes or no? Yeah. Yes or no? Yes or no? I don't need a whole else answer the question. Yes or no? I want to thank you, sir, yeah. for, for, no. for endorsing me for supervisor because this is the job of the supervisor. Okay. And that's what we're going to say is thank you for endorsing. Thank you. endorsement. I appreciate the endorsement. It's your job to do. I told you that you need to do it. So do it. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Dylan. That being said, okay. But I did ask the local bureau, the CPA, 25 years, I don't So I asked for your assistant, which I asked all my board members to assist and help me. And what did you say? No, we actually, actually hold on a second. Hold on a second. I want to I want to correct you on that. Did I not sit with down with you in February 7th of 2022 and discuss this with you? No, hold on, hold on. You brought this up, so well, I think we need to discuss it. And I got yeah. as I and out of that meeting, you did not ask me for my help at that meeting. At that meeting, you specifically said I will take care of it, and then you did nothing. So at this point in time, why would I help anybody who refuses to do the job? You did it. Thank you. Councilman Johnson. All right, so I'm not going to play politics. I'm going to take care of calendar. Um, for the month of February, the building department was pretty busy. They did 43 permits and two certificates, $206,037 uh, worth of total fees collected. Um, complaints they addressed to 33 and carried out 777 inspections. Um, water and sewer, also pretty busy as always. Uh, as you know, our infrastructure is dated. These guys are busy taking care of water leaks and breaks that happen on a regular basis. So we had three main breaks. Uh, all were repaired um, in a timely manner with very little interruption in service. Two leaks um, in the roadway that actually had to be repaired because they were causing icing in the evening hours and potential to drop below yeah. freezing. <clears throat> and as always, the town would like to thank the residents. Um, you know, we appreciate your we appreciate your cooperation uh, when we're doing repairs. We hope to be without water. The uh, tower drive and inward water tanks bids are in opened um, and hopefully the project will be underway this spring. That's something we definitely want to um, take care of. And that helps with the uh, total trihalomethane issues that we have by getting rid of the organics out of the tanks. As you've heard us dis discuss before with the two other tanks that we've already rehabilitated. Um, the crews in the water and sewer department are working with the highway department in the next several weeks to replace fire hydrants. Um, the plan is to get as many as done as possible this year, because uh, you know, as a hydrant that's not working, it could be the difference between, you know, serious property damage or even worse, should there be a fire. Um, the reminder that the spring fire hydrant flushing is the weeks of April 10th to the 23rd. Uh, the town will be doing ours within the first week or so, but you'll have um, private contractors uh, fire department flushing other hydrants throughout those two week periods. So if you get discolored water, it should clear up quickly. Um, so not to worry there. And again, that's something that takes care of the organics and the water system, which helps with the trihalomethane issue that we've been trying to uh, tackle. So by flushing the uh, organics out of the water lines, um, that's one of the uh, perks we do to try and make that as limited as possible. So there's some good news. The latest water sampling results for the trihalomethane heliosinic acids came back within the EPA guidelines for drinking water and below the action level of 80 micrograms per liter of water. 
However, there's still some bad news. Just because that was one round, the other rounds was we had some areas that were slightly elevated. You'll still get that letter that goes out that um, you know says they were above the standards. But our latest round was actually pretty good. And again, we're still working with our engineers on a daily basis to try and address that issue. The sewer department clarifier project is underway. Both clarifier tanks one and two have been empty drained and measured up so the equipment can be ordered to restore those. And it was done in um, like in a way that we took one out of service, measured it, put it back in, and took two out. So there was no disruption on um, any of the sewer stuff that nobody even from the town knows that, that was occurring. So that was a great job by the department and the contractor. The Western Avenue pump station project is underway. Uh, the contractors started to install piping, uh, and that project will continue to move forward as materials become available because there still is a backlog in materials, believe it or not. The water and sewer department continues to work with contractors throughout the town on a daily basis. And as always, those departments have to run um, you know, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So great job by those guys and gals to take care of that. Um, comments. I would just like to congratulate all the award recipients tonight. I think that's pretty awesome that this town takes it the um, time to recognize people in our community that make a difference. I think it's important to let them know that we appreciate all that they do. I don't want to get into the mess that was going on earlier, um, but I'm not, not going to go there tonight. Spring break is right around the corner. So you guys that are taking vacations or your family or at least have your kids home from school, please take the time to enjoy them, do some fun stuff with them and let them know how much you appreciate them and um, how important they are in your life because remember our children are our future. Um, so do everything you can to make them better people. And hopefully our community will get better and better every time we have a new generation coming up. Easter's right around the corner, so I just want to wish everybody a happy Easter. Please, again, enjoy your family time, quality time. That's the most important thing. Obviously, we like to have dinner, and that's important, and everything else, certainly. But again, you know, be with your friends and family, because there's nothing more important than that. You can have everything in the world, but without friends and family, you really don't have anything. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Cohen. Okay, let's start with highway. Uh, for the month of March, we have been widening the unpaved portion of Abrahamson Road and Highland Lakes Road, and we're working on replacing drainage and prepping, uh, prepping Brody Road for pavement later in the year. We've been doing a lot of basin repairs throughout the town, as well as taking down a lot of dead trees and patching potholes. We'll be opening our brush, leaf, and grass clipping drop-off at the highway garage on April 8th. And the hours will be from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, you must enter our facility off of Kiesel Road. This will be open every Saturday from April 8th until December. Uh, Veterans Affairs. So, Sal Lucido is here and had to take off. Um, but he left this with me. The Town of Wallkill Youth Coalition put out a collection jar and they had their Valentine with a veteran spaghetti dinner. They collected $400 to help with repairs done to the wall and to help pay off the next section. The spaghetti dinner was a great success because of all the organizations involved. A true collaboration of service organizations. All the veterans organizations, Town of Wallkill Police uh, Youth Coalition, Town of Wallkill Police Community Council, Wallkill East Rotary, Business and Professional Women's Groups. And he left this here with me. So, and we got some uh, committee members here. We got Mike Cody and Rosie and Larry uh, Walsh. And uh, I'll give it to you afterwards. All right, guys. So, um, moving on, all pickup. It's back. It's here. April 16th, first board. Every year we, every other year we, we swap them. So last year, uh, fourth board was first and we went four, three, two, one. This year we'll go one, two, three, four. So if you live in the first ward, April 16th, and uh, I'm sure everybody's going to want to speak. Well, actually, we're almost done, huh? So second, second ward is April 23rd. Third ward is April 30th. 
and Fourth Ward is uh, May 7th. Have your garbage out the Sunday night prior to that, that date so that uh, you don't know when they're coming. They could come Monday, they could come Friday. Who knows? But once they come, they're probably not going to come back. So you don't want to miss it. And uh, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. Yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm done. Yeah. So, Thank you, Supervisor. Um, I'll start with Parks. Um, this is from our Park Superintendent. We finished all the fence repairs at Howard Drive the Little League Complex, and they've been on the Coconut when there's a snowstorm. Our Parks Department also joins the DPW to clear the snow, so they've been involved with the removal of the snow, whatever snow we've gotten. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me. They started spring cleanup in all the parks and facilities, and they received the shade canopy for the new dog park at Circleville Park. And they dug the footings and should have a canopy up this week, and then they can finish adding the surfacing and benches and accessories in the next two weeks. So it should be the park, the dog park at Circleville Park, should be ready by um, the spring by Easter. We prepared and served corned beef dinner for 70 seniors at the community center and handed out approximately 70 takeout dinners. They like, we'd like to acknowledge retired town employee Gary Lake, pa, 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 <laughs> and Joe Brewster, who came on both days to cook and prepare corned beef and sides. They both have been helping with this event for over 20 years. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Bill. Our next Event will be our Easter egg hunt, which at Circle Wheel Park on April 8th at 10 a.m. Um, so some of the, the things that have been scheduled in the town, you know, I guess say we can disagree on all levels, and but we have to respect each other, and and it should be. Discussion and, and differences of opinion in a respectful manner without making accusations, without throwing stones and everything else. It's just you know, unfortunate those individuals that choose not to do that um, hold the town back, and, and not only physically, but in, in morale and everything else. So, um, thank you, Supervisor, and his staff for always moving forward in a positive way and, and making, creating events and acknowledging people that, you know. Coming out of the COVID and, and the whole pandemic, we need things like that. We need to have a positive face and, and, and keep our faith that, that people are still good and we can do good things. Um, that being said, the 2023 upcoming free events in the town, we just had the St. Patrick's Day luncheon. April 8th will be the Easter egg hunt at 10 a.m. at Circle Road Park. On April 22nd, um, Earth Day cleanup, and that will be from 9 to 12, and everyone is meeting here at Town Hall for that. May 20th is Touch a Truck at Circleville Park, and that's from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's a big hit with the little kids. They love it. Um, June, June 19th is Juneteenth Jubilee. That's 3 to 5 at the Gallery of Wall. On June 24th, Fishing Derby, and all these events will be on on. Post it on the website. You can, if you want to reference them and, and have any questions, just call the, the office. Um, 20, June 24th, Fishing Derby at 8 30 at Circle Road Park. And July 2nd will be our Independence Day fireworks display. And that will be from 6 to 9. And we're bringing it back to the town of Walk Hill Golf Course, which is, um, I hear a lot of people are happy about that. Um, moving ahead. We are police. Our current staffing is at 49 full time sworn police officers. Uh, arrest data to date, I uh, guess we were up 2.89%, 143 arrests for 2023 versus 138 for 2022. Uh, the next police community council meeting will be 7 p.m. on April 6th. Uh, police Youth Coalition. Last night, they hosted a movie night during which. We watched Matilda the musical. That's pretty cool. It was amazing that they had this big screen and the kids were all in pajamas and had blankets on the floor. And our Rosie was in pajamas. Uh, <laughs> so 
Uh, it, it was, it was, you know, the kids loved it. It was the life of them. They had a big screen that one of the officers um, let us borrow. Uh, and Rony, you do a great job. Those kids, they really appreciate you. And so do the parents. And so do we. So it was a great time and it was well attended. Um, thank you for, for Rosie putting this event together and Sergeant Pat Marcio and Joe Andre for setting up the screen projector and sound system. Um, future events include Hudson Valley Renegade Games, our annual police versus youth memorial softball tournament. The next meeting will be at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, April 18th at the community center. On March 20th, the county informed us that we will be receiving a grant in the amount of $9,620 to fund our coalition. Um, and the supervisor received that, and we were ecstatic about that. Okay. On a darker note, arrest on March 15th, the town of Warfield detective John Sonnefeld arrested um, an individual charging her with criminally negligent homicide. The arrest was the result of investigation into the April 7th accident that caused the death of Jean Carlos Cattles. Our police department was assisted by New York State Police and Dutchess County District Attorney's Office. Our Junior Police Academy, based, based on the great success of last year's Junior Police Academy, this year's program will expand to a four one-week session. The Academy will be daily from 9 to 3. The Academy will include activities such as drill lessons, physical fitness, character, safety lessons, guest lectures, crime scene investigation, court procedures, and tour. Team building exercises, CPR, and first aid training, and much more. The sessions for the Junior Police Academy will run from the first session will be June 26th to 30th, and that will be for third to fifth graders. Second session is July 17th to the 21st, and that'll be for third to fifth graders. Session three will be July 24th to the 28th, and that's for our sixth and eighth graders. And the last session will be um, August 14th to the 18th, and that again will be from sixth to eighth graders. The academy will include, it will conclude with a graduation ceremony at the end of each week with pizza, cupcakes, or cadets, Official announcement letters and cadet application can be picked up from the Town of Walker Police Department, Maple Hill Elementary School, Monhagen Middle School, William A. Carter Elementary School, Circleville Middle School, <coughs> Circleville Elementary School, and Anderson Elementary School. Applications will be available starting April 11th and must be completed and returned to the above location no, no later than May 8th. To any of the above locations. Sorry. If you have any questions, please con please contact Stephanie Roberto at Roberto. Stephanie. Roberto at aecsdm. org. And Chief, I'll let you speak on the. Um, we just had a, a discussion on, on mobile mental health partnerships, and so I'll let the Chief touch on that. Um, I just touch on this because it's it's been going on and on and on and and um, you know when I when I first ran for office and there was oh there was controversy and there was tough decisions to be made. Um, I said to myself, you know, my kids are watching this every once in a while; they will reference it. So. I wanted to leave them one day, once they grow up and they have to make those tough decisions that they reflect on dad, on me, and they say, you know, dad made a tough decision. It wasn't a popular one because, you know, people were not going to like him or dislike him, but it was the right one and it was the right thing to do. So, you know, I'm going to say something, people are not going to like it. People in my own party may not like it, but it's the right thing to do. Back in September 8, 2021, then Supervisor Nidanto made a motion for a resolution to implement procedures. It was seconded by Councilman Meyer. The resolution read as such Resol Resolution of Town of Warkill approving accounting and payroll reporting procedures. Whereas the Town of Warkill has determined that it is necessary to set forth certain operating policies and procedures 
with respect to the town and county and payroll departments. Now, therefore, it is hereby resolved that the town of Walk, town board and the town of Walk, Walk Hill, that the following policies and procedures shall become effective immediately. A county department, the town controller audits all warrants prior to each check run. Signatures on each warrant summary report by the controller is required to confirm each warrant has been reviewed and approved. On a bi-weekly basis, the town controller will submit to the town board current warrant of vouchers to be paid. Town board members will sign off that they have received and reviewed the warrant, and upon approval by a majority, all vouchers contained in said warrant will be paid, other than those with more documentation if more documentation is needed. In the event of an emergency requiring the town controller to process a voucher outside the existing warrant approval procedure, the following must occur. Town controller must obtain prior approval from the supervisor or his designee. The town supervisor or his designee will be required to review all supporting documentation prior to the invoice voucher being processed and signed off, allowing the controller to directly process the invoice voucher. A dual signature will be required on the check prior to the check being released with payment. Number four, on all payments greater than $25,000, a due signature will be required on the check or authorized payment. Number five, the town controller will provide to the supervisor and town board on a bi-weekly basis a budget versus actual report for the department and fund. On a quality basis, the controller will submit to town board a trial balance and cash flow analysis. Payroll department. The payroll manager will be required to submit a monthly basis on a monthly basis to the town supervisor monthly payroll massive change report. The town supervisor will review the monthly change report and sign off that the report has been reviewed and approved. Prior to the generation of the first payroll each year, the payroll manager shall submit to the town board a payroll change report reflecting any payroll or position changes that set forth in the department. Adopt the annual budget for each. That's to track if anybody gets promoted, if we hire somebody, we track and make sure that the salary is on line. It was it was um, voted in the budget. This was approved by the entire board, voted and approved by the entire board, as set forth the following policies and procedures. And we've been getting a list of warrants since then and voting on it. And everybody, until the previous supervisor left, voted on several warrant everybody not just in december i have my notes everybody i checked with our auditor and and i asked him was there anything missing from this procedure anything missing from this warrant process that would keep us from voting on it and he said no this is exactly what the town needed and and it should continue now this is the process that the town uses to pay its bills. People do services to the, to the town. They, they, we buy things from local vendors and they submit bills. They have to get paid so they can keep going and their, and their businesses can keep functioning. And if the town doesn't pay them, well, we stand bad with them. If the town doesn't pay them, we hold them up and we hold ourselves up. So, this is the process and, and it's followed and we vote on it. Our number one priority when we get elected, along with the other priorities, is to audit claims and pay bills. And that's what we do when we look at the warrants. That's what we do when we sign off on them. So please, let's, let's try and, and be civil to each other. <laughs> You know, it's a political year. Why does it have to be ugly? Make your point. Let us know what you're running on. Let us know what you think you're going to change or improve in it, but it doesn't have to be ugly. Thank you. All right. This is my time. I'm not going to make this political. This the forum for it only. But I'm going to make a couple of statements. First of all, today, congratulations to all the women we honor today. Congratulations to the town of Crawford on their bicentennial. Um, last Sunday, I had the opportunity to go to the American Legion Post 1181, who had a great breakfast, great turnout. Um, 
and cause to Gary Lake, thank you very much, Jay, the Parks Department, um, who cooked the Friday before and made our St. Patty's Day um, successful. It's a great turnout. One thing is that we just rolled out a new emergency alert system. Um, you're going to see these around around the town. If you've got a phone, sign up. Please do. Um, one of the great things about this system is that if you are in an area and you do have a cell phone, even though you're not signed up, and say there's a water main break and, and the road is closed and you happen to be in that area, you will get a notification. You do not collect your information, you just get the notification. Um, it is uh, a lot of thought was put into the system to give information to our residents. So um, please do sign up and also make phone calls. If you don't have a, a phone that has um, internet or um, doesn't get a text message, it will also call you. So it's something good that we rolled out. We have this, com this coming Saturday, the town will have is uh, Earth Day Summit, like I said in the past. We're engaging our businesses, community leaders, and the community. Um, There's going to be our first summit where we're going to hopefully get everyone who are stakeholders in this town to help us clean up the town, not just you know on Earth Day when we pick a row. So I'm hoping that um, we have a good turnout, which I, I've been getting some feedback, and uh, a lot of the residents and businesses will be attending. Um, next Saturday. If anyone is interested, I will be holding uh, coffee with the supervisor, uh, 9 to 11, right in this room. Come speak to me. All right. So, a lot has been said tonight, and I just want to make a quick statement. A brief comment with regard to a news article appearing earlier this week containing claims that the FBI was conducting an investigation into town of Walker Finance. It is simply not true. <laughs> it's simply not true. We have contacted the FBI and they have confirmed that no investigation of any kind is taking place. As a retired police detective, I can confirm that federal criminal allegations are the only ones that I investigated by the FBI. I've been in office 15 months. No FBI agent has contacted me or my office. I lived in that world, law enforcement. Furthermore, no local or state law enforcement agency has contacted me or my office related to any alleged past or present alleged criminal activity within our town government. Not having a county policy or procedure, which is what is alleged in the article, is not a crime, a federal crime, and not even a crime. Furthermore, the allegation is not true. My like councilman Meyer has stated earlier, I did give policy and procedures out three weeks ago. I did an office 15 months. He's been a councilman seven years. These policy and procedures are in place, and we are actually in the process of updating some of them. So therefore, it is important for this town board to work together. Unfortunately, that is not happening, but the majority of the board is working together. I've done nothing but help this community move forward, move this town forward, coming out of COVID, coming out of what happened in this town two years before I took office. We have to move forward, working together, and we have to be positive. If they want to be negative, that's on them. We're going to keep the road, we're going to keep the high road, and we're going to be positive. Because the, what we've been doing here since I took office is once again recognizing our community, our community leaders, people who are important, but elect us to do our job. 15 months I've been in office, and I know my team and myself and the majority of this board 
have what's best and have the best interest of this town. With that, I would like to give it over to Tom Clark. Oh, is that happy news? Um, if you want to visit our dog park when it opens, Sunday is your chance to come to the community center from 11 to 1. The Orange County Health Department is offering a free rabies clinic. And I believe, I know Middletown requires that at their dog park that dogs are vaccinated um, before they go there. So that's Sunday, 11 to 1 at the community center. And if you're around on Sunday and you want anything better to do, and you want to be in charge of paper towels and Windex um, to do the uh, mentionable, stop in because we can always use help. Um, fishing licenses are for sale, Mr. Lake. Trout season, April 1st. Um, we always have the DEC licenses available. The pavilions, um, I have to say, I believe the month of July is booked. So if you're planning on having a party, um, you should give us a call because that's um, filling up quickly. There's some new legislation that takes effect, I believe, on the 28th of this month um, that would allow for individuals to obtain a one day license to perform a marriage ceremony. Um, it's kind of uh, convoluted a little bit what the rules are, um, but we'll have all that information. We've had a couple calls from folks um, who would like to do that. So they could marry people for one day? You can get a license for one day, yes, to marry folks. Um, thank you to Chad from, the, uh, he's the, Han the Hannaford manager down the hill. Um, I think it's the last two or three years he split the cost with me on the cupcakes for the seniors. Um, and Chad is a, a great guy. Um, in the middle of COVID, uh, he put a trailer out in his parking lot and filled it with canned goods um, and pet food and, and all kinds of things. Um, so I don't like to like pull up stores, but that he is a, a genuine man and um, always willing to, to help when, when we ask him. Um, tomorrow night, I'm gonna go to the Girl Scouts. We have two troops here um, in town of Walk Hill, and I think Sherry told me the other day, she's upwards of 90 girls now. They have what's going to be called their gallery night where they're going to be um, showing their artwork in all different mediums. And we have um, those beautiful hangers here in the hall, um, Mr. Supervisor. Maybe we can look at some of their work and bring yeah. it here so that folks could come in um, and see that. And I'll end with, um, there are many women elected in Orange County and in the country actually. And on Tuesday, in the village of Goshen, a lovely young lady by the name of Molly O'Donnell was elected mayor of the village of Goshen, and she's the first woman to serve in that capacity. And um, I wish her all the best. Wow. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. So what time is the Girl Scout then? 7.30. Next, we have the Commission on Public Works. Is that 7 or 7.30? 7 7.30. 7 Yes, good evening. Just real quick tonight, um, we're wrapping up our, uh, hopefully we're wrapping up our winter weather season. Uh, it's morphing into a very busy spring that we've already been taking care of. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the fact that we did not get a lot of snow um, throughout the winter uh, certainly is not an indication that our roads are going to be in any better shape. Uh, the extreme freeze and extreme cold and the extreme and warmth, that actually tears the roads up more than uh, a real hard winter does. So anyway, we've been out working uh, hard, trying to fill potholes, things like that. I want to thank the entire DPW team for their dedication and commitment. Uh, the Walk Hill Golf Course is open. We've actually really, really never closed. Um, so if it's a nice day, you think the course is open, take a ride out and I'm sure we'll get you out there. Uh, right now, of course, there's no carts, but you can certainly walk the course. And uh, I know somebody who played the other day and he said it's in great shape. Uh, Corn's Campground is getting ready to go for the uh, 2023. Uh, they will be opening um, early in April. So again, if you're a camper and you want to go out to Corns, go out there and uh, check them out. Uh, the Parks Department is very busy getting all town parks in shape, of course, uh, including the Little League Complex. I believe opening day in the parade is set for April 22nd. So we'll be ready for that. We spoke about bulk pickup, postcards are forthcoming, all the information down the town website. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. Um, from the OEM side, of course, things in OEM, are going well. We always stay busy. Um, our OEM coordinator, Joe Andre, has been working with Orange County and all of our five school districts for an upcoming reunification drill. Uh, the supervisor spoke about the hyperpulse. Please sign up for that. 
That's on the town's uh, Facebook. It's on the website. You can scan the QR code. If you need to do it the old fashioned way, there's a phone number on there and we'll get you hooked up. Um, lastly, a couple of things. Congratulations. One of our DPW employees, Luke Mortensen, and his wife. Uh, they had a new baby girl, Jovi Jean, and mom and daughter are doing very well. And uh, like I said last year during uh, Women's History Month and you know, basically all the time, number one, congratulations to all the award recipients. Um, I was, again, I was the youngest of five children, four older sisters. And of course, my mom and I grew up in a house with uh, five very strong female role models um, who I credit with uh, helping me get to where I am today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Lou, can you touch, I was trying to find a note. Um, so we got recently, we just got some great news because uh, we had that, that that meeting with the constituents uh, about the water. Yes. And so, yeah. So, uh, as Councilman Johnson spoke to earlier, our trihalomethane results for February uh, were well within the parameters of uh, where we need to be. We have made some system changes. Um, it does not get us out of, uh, I guess we would call the letter rating campaign. There will be another notification going out, but the notification will be clear uh, that we are trending in the right direction. We did have a great meeting here with one of the communities, uh, Wildflowers specifically. And like I said, at any time, if anybody has individual questions on the trihalomethane, aleocytic acid issue, uh, just reach out to us. Um, we did, of course, uh, we're gonna award, or we did award the bid tonight for the refurbishment of a couple more of our tanks. Um, those two tanks are gonna get refurbished, uh, similar to what we did in Washington Heights. These two tanks are right about the same age. They're about 30 years old. Um, so what will happen is we'll go, we'll a contractor will go in there, basically they sandblast and they clean them out. Um, the newest technology now is to put an aerator in the tank so that the water is constantly in motion so the byproducts can't uh, recreate inside the tank. Um, but the, like I said, the, uh, you know, the folks in the water and sewer department are they're really busting their butt trying to get to the bottom of this. They're doing a great job um, along with our engineering firm. So things are definitely going in the right direction. Any questions, uh, like I said, I've got an open door. Just stop and see me or give me a shout. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Please check. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, just three quick things. So it was a great event the other night with Matilda. We enjoyed the movie. Uh, Rosie, Joe Andre, and Pat Marcel did a great job setting things up, but the audio didn't work, right? And who came to the rescue? The supervisor with the skill set. After about 15 minutes, he was able to somehow figure it out and get the sound going, because otherwise, we would have had a narrative the whole movie. So, we may not have enjoyed it as much. So, just an accreditation update. So, the department's been under the accreditation process for just one year now, exactly. We adopted 93 policies, so we're 75% of the way done. We have 37 policies left to go. Our target is to knock out five weeks. So that being said, we'll be done in six weeks. At that point, we look forward to a 90 day review period in house when the state accreditors will come in and audit our systems, our policies, and our procedures. The team, including John Vespucci, Sergeant Dan Ward, doing a great job, great effort. Team effort, everyone's involved. Uh, all the officers are doing policies, town board, community council. We appreciate all the support throughout this process. It's been a long year doing this. We're almost at the end of the life, the end of the moment. So thank you for doing all the support for this. Lastly, Eric touched on um, a local mental health conversation. I'll, I'll describe it as that. So there's a problem in our community. It's not just here in the town of Walkill, it, 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 regionally and, and, and nationally. Um, there's many cases where police respond to mental health crises. Uh, we average about 542 incidents a year. So we're in discussion with mobile mental health, who is a great quasi governmental entity within the county that we and other agencies use to staff our department with mobile health, mobile mental health clinicians who will respond with police officers. So we're working on the MOU now with the town attorney and their attorney, that we've done shortly, and then there'll be further announcements of this coming up. But this is very forward thinking, aggressive policing. It's certainly something that's necessary here because we're going to be working hand in hand with an entity that's already providing services to us, except they'll be here five days a week, eight hours a day, and it's not costing the town dime or be coming via a state grant to implement this through assemblywoman government. So we thank her, we thank the board for support on this, and we look forward to rolling this out in the near future. Chief, can you also um, talk about the program that we just signed up and we passed the resolution on, on um, partnership where we're bringing in, you know, this, this whole thing about policing and getting our police trained to deal with 
people with mental health. Uh, and the full training is not always there. And so they need that help. And when we try to reach out to those individuals, they're either on call somewhere else. And so um, Chief and one of the officers presented a program, and, and I'll let you speak on it, but it, it's going to benefit the town, the police department, and those individuals that need that help. And it's not going to cost the town. Uh, I'll give this part and I'll turn it over to you. We're going to have two individuals on site, fully paid with car, and it's not going to cost the town anything. So go ahead, Chief. It, it, it's very progressive. It's in the implementation. We're trying to work on the MOU to get this rolled out. But it will it will involve two mental health clinicians that are here five days a week, eight hours a day initially. The program is funded in, in entirety for a year, so we have to develop a policy. Um, but but mobile mental health has been a wonderful resource for us in our community. There's many occasions where we have somebody who's essentially barricaded, they pose no threat to anyone but themselves, and our policies will take all the time necessary to talk that person out of the place where they are and agree to come with us to you know, get the mental health services they need, usually through Barnett Medical Center's behavioral health unit. And mobile mental health has been a tremendous resource for us, talking to these people. And in every single case, we were able to get everyone, you know, people, the person, I should say, out of the house successfully without any injury to that person or any of the officers. So this program helped us expand that. But as we mentioned during the work session last week, um, and it's like Mike Ronaldo has been the driving force behind this. We wait up to two hours sometimes to get those resources on the scene. It's an incredible drain on our police department with weeks for resources. In addition, obviously, most importantly, to being a greater risk for the person that needs the services, waiting two hours is just unacceptable. The county realizes it, uh, Assemblywoman Gunther realizes it, the town board definitely acknowledges it. So that's why we're implementing this program because it will speed up the help that's getting to the person on the scene. Right. Great. It's, Thank being, you. it's going to be administered through the town with uh, access supports. Uh, which is the entity uh, I spoke with their council yesterday. And they have something similar they do in the city of Kingston, where they provide uh, these types of services. So we're going to try and um, take some of the points from that agreement, mold it to what we need for Walk Hill, and hopefully have the, uh, the um, skeletal part of a, an agreement that I can present to the board in the next next work session or the one after that so we can move it forward. Great. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Well, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we've got public participation, public participation, three minutes um, on any item. So you want to come up? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, it's OK. That's all right. So I, I'm happy to Christian. So in my opinion, we need uh, no turn on red signs on Route 211 because I walk that little sidewalk fairly often. And I was actually hit by a guy starting from a rolling stop. So I wasn't hurt, thank God. But, you know, even I was walking on it today, I saw a guy nearly get run over. So the way it works is there's a little sign, they've got a little sign, they say it's safe to walk. But from the car's perspective, it says yield to pedestrians, not stop on red, period. And in practice, like a lot of drivers will just take that license to just start rolling. And, you know, I'm afraid if they're, if they're hitting people, they, they must be, you know, if they haven't killed one or two already, I'm afraid that they're going to, you know, I don't think it'd be too much effort. I don't believe it's a partisan issue. You know, it will not hurt your, your con constituents one way or the other. I hope you can fix this up very soon, please. Thank you. I believe, uh, Councilman. When is um, friends with your dad? I, I, I and, guess they know each other personally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, yeah. we, you came in and we talked. It. George sent out uh, uh, a letter to New York State, and have you heard back, George, or not? I have not. Yeah. yeah. So, so like, I got the impression that's still kind of within the town's jurisdiction. It's, up it's not. Yeah, it's it's a state right. state road. Right. Unfortunately, it's, you know, and and we're kind of in our hands are tied. But it doesn't mean that we don't try. And we did, right? And we well, we wanted to out of your hands, or or you don't try. I mean, no. What I can, what we can do is petition, basically, you know, ask the state, which is what we've done. We we have not heard a reply from the no. speed limits. Yeah, nice. we got access mission. That is that is very odd, I and mean, I'm guessing I'm gonna have to take your word for it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank okay. you. Anyone on Zoom? No. Anyone in the audience? Yeah. 
not to tell you my name because everybody should know it by now. So I just want to thank the Rotary Club. I want to thank my committee. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're out of the hospital. I uh, hope everything's okay. Uh, I don't know how much the check was. <laughs> Four hundred dollars. Four hundred. Four hundred. Yes, sir. All right, that, that helps us. Out. Yep. That helps us out a lot. I just want to thank you, and I want to tell you is that fifty years ago was the war in Vietnam. This year is our anniversary, so if you see a vet. Say thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. you mind, you mind. Give me the check. Good <laughs> <laughs> money. Put it in the chip bag. Put it in the bank tomorrow. Thank you. Anyone on Zoom? Anyone in the audience? <laughs> Good evening, Nick Bay, I'm back again. Um, the only Walkdale.com website has been republished with updated information. Per council's request, I put together documents showing falsified reports by Walkdale officials who allowed illegal actions to continue on both Ford's properties. There's a $220 million EPA lawsuit against my neighbor, Mark Ford. Trial notice beginning May 9th, 2023. The proceedings will hopefully shine light on why the BBW, Daniel DePew, and other Walkdale officials allowed Mark Ford to dump here at all, let alone fill in federally protected wetlands and streams. Wallkill labor, equipment, materials were used to create landfill infrastructure for both of Mark Ford's properties. Toxic New York City waste was dumped and buried overnight in front of my house while Ford employed at least five Wallkill staff. My family's trial against Mark Ford is scheduled for June 2023. Subpoena requests show Wallkill inspectors falsified or omitted reports to benefit Mark Ford and McCary's unpermitted operations. George Serrano was made aware of these allegations as soon as they were discovered and ignored the reports. That's why I started becoming public meetings, which so far has not seemed to help. The recent Times Union article reported FBI investigations into the town. After reading that, I realized I have something in common with former Supervisor Frank Condado. We have both spoken to the FBI for hours at length about alleged corruption in the town of Walkill. And the agents I talked to, the, the Times I uh, reported, were federal. We have also both spoken to the Times Union and other news organizations that have issues here in Walkill. There is more public exposure to come, and you have a chance to get ahead of it still. There's at least one difference between what Frank Condado told the FBI and what I told them. I reported that George Serrano was complicit in regarding Ford's recent operations that are ongoing. As George stood in my driveway campaign, he saw the illegal operations site in the landfill area with his own eyes while reviewing the only in Walkhill.com website. The next day, George was campaigning with Daniel DePew. DePew is named by Ford in his EPA lawsuit scheduled for this May. Ford states that Daniel DePew, as MS4 compliance officer and female representative, gave him permission to dump here in Walkhill. Ford's disclosure statement that shows this is also on the only in Walkhill.com website. George Serrano, that seven months ago, you heard Gary Lake say there was no site plan for the current operation of Ford properties, and you said you would stop it the next day. That was false. I'm still waiting. Ford and McCarry's landscaping have run uncommitted operations for years while employing Walkill staff and it continues today. Again, only in Walkill.com is the website, and I'll update it if I find time and add more information. The website has many views when it was just republished last week, but those are mainly coming from the world of harness racing and animal rights activists. There are current horse doping, race fixing, animal rights issues, and other things that have ties to what's on the website and the local players involved. Everything is being investigated by the FBI or the proper authorities. It's a shame that Walkville cannot be trusted to investigate itself in some cases. So, George, what am I missing? Why can't the building inspector go into Mark Ford's property and cite the illegal actions and start a paper trail? What am I missing? I'm going to say thank you, lawyer. I feel like somebody's going to say thank you. Yep. Go ahead. My understanding is that the building department went out there. That is correct. Oh, so is anything going on? No. No. So my building department, the building department did go out there. Did they go out there seven or eight months ago when you sold them? And are they doing anything? After the last time you came, they went out there. Gotcha. Okay, I guess I'll quarter invest all the activities that might have happened since. But they're still running on permitted operations and it's being allowed. Been happening since the toxic waste was dumped in front of my house. Yeah. Happening today. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom? Anyone in the audience? That being said, thank you. Thank you for coming out. We'll make a motion to adjourn.